Hey guys, welcome to the Challenge Podcast. I'm Coach Steve. And I'm Coach Nick. And we're going to be talking about everything fitness, health, and the challenge. Let's get on with the show. What's up guys, Coach Steve here, and welcome back to another episode of the Challenge Weekly Show. Today I'm joined with our co-host, Coach Nick. Nick, how are we doing today? I'm very well. Thank you, Coach Steve. How are you? I'm I'm well. I'm well. And I'm excited because today is episode number 67 of the Challenge Weekly Show. 67. Uh, what is it? 6, 7, 8, 9. Because why is 6 afraid of 7? Because 7, 8, 9. Oh, that's yeah, true. That one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, all my dad jokes are coming in uh, full steam ahead. And uh, Challenge Weekly Show episode number 67. We've got lots to talk about, Nick. Uh, what an exciting day. Yeah, was seven when it ate nine? Was it in a calorie deficit or was it in a surplus? Well, see, seven is quite lean, you know, so it's pretty pretty straight line. So it uh, has was, a bad back. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he's very he's very upright, you know. And you know, when you get the 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 letters of seven, S E B E N, if you add a T, it makes Stephen. Oh. So you know, I'm I'm seven, and I ate nine. So that's that's life, really. Yeah, absolutely. Like, <laughs> sure. You guys don't need to listen to anything more because you've just been given the meaning of life right there. So seven is Stephen. Seven is Stephen with a, with a T. That's it. Yeah. That, that's about all you need to know from today's show. Thank you very much for listening. That's it. Well, if you enjoyed this episode, we'll catch you next week on episode number 68. Done. All right. <laughs> no, look, uh, look, Nick, I, I actually want to break the, the fourth wall here for a moment. Mm-hmm. So at the time of this recording, it's about midday on on a Monday, and we Ooh. release we'll release the podcast on a Tuesday morning. Okay, so that's the uh, power of podcasts. So we record a little bit earlier than we than we publish it. Now I've been playing around with our new app, Nick. So we've been we've got the first prototypes of of our app. We've got it on our phones, and it's a really cool feature on the app, Nick. And I'm going to tell everybody about it. So okay. we have a, a feature where you can integrate the app with either your Apple Health or your Google Health on your Android or iOS. And what it will do is we'll start pulling your pulling your steps, your step count from um, whatever device you're using. Let that be like an Apple Watch or a Garmin or a Fitbit. Um, and it's gonna add it into our app, the M Challenge app into a leaderboard. Ooh, so we're gonna have a step count leaderboard. And I went and checked it this morning. It was about 10 a.m. So I went and checked it, opened up the app. And I must say, how the hell did you do 8,000 steps before 10 a.m., Nick? I always do my steps at 5.30 in the morning. So at least I can really prove to you now that that is true. However, I am on less steps at the moment, even though I'm in prep. So uh, I wouldn't do 10,000. I'm only supposed to do a certain amount, um, which is so good. So I'm not supposed to do more than about 8,000. So um, at the moment, I'm, I'm at, yeah, I'm pretty much there. So um, I'm not supposed to, I don't even know how I'm going to walk to the kitchen later. That's that's insane, Nick. And I, have to uh, get carried. <laughs> I, feel, I feel more and more seen every time I open up that app and I see the leaderboard and you know, yeah. I, I actually don't wear a, a Fitbit or a Garmin. Like I, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of um, you know, stuff on my hands. So, uh, you know, my poor, my poor partner doesn't like, uh, wants me to wear a ring. I don't like wearing the ring and then the watches oh, and stuff I don't like either. that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So my, my data is always skewed. So the, on my device, my device will pick up the steps I do just from like holding it. So if you have a, a an Apple phone or like a, an Android phone, um, or most smart devices, um, the phone will actually start counting your steps. So if you opened up, like let's say the Apple Health app, and if it's not connected to like a Google, uh, like a, a, an Apple Watch or like a Garmin or a Fitbit or something, mm-hmm. you can actually see how many steps you do. Um, it's not super accurate. That's like with most smart tech, it's not super accurate, but it's a bit of a guide. And um, I, I often like walk the dog and such with my phone at home. I just like to have a little bit of disconnect from technology. So I feel a little bit seen when I open up the app and it's only done like a thousand steps even though I know I've done a few more than a thousand steps. Um, so Nick, I'm telling you now, if you open up the app as in the prototype and you see that I've got fewer steps, that, that, that's the reason why. That's uh, that's my uh, 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 excuse, I'm going to say. Yeah. I can't even <laughs> see you on there. So. Oh gosh, yeah. Okay. But um, okay. it's all good because, uh, you know, you could always, if you really want to get into the competition, you could always just put the phone in your back pocket or something. Or yeah. Strap it onto little Frankie dog. I'm gonna to have to link it to. I'm gonna to have to go get a, like a Fitbit and strap it to like Frankie, and uh, the the dog can do all my steps for me. Just so you know I what? can be top. How how exciting is this that the app? See, even when we're testing it, we've found that it actually 
has um, created a little bit of momentum with us and our steps. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I'm not competitive at all, not not one single tiny little bit, but I, I really aim to be on the top of this leaderboard every day, all day. Every day, all day. I'll do my work. I'll just walk and work and work and yeah. walk. Work and walk and work. Yeah, yeah, you know, like no no competition. It's <laughs> But I think it's going to be really great. It's going to be so much fun for everyone. And I can picture all the people that will want to be at the top of the leaderboard. It's just going to be awesome. So that's just a, an extra bit of fun, but it's also a really good way to stay accountable. Um, you know, imagine if you, you get like 9,975 and someone goes, come on, and you just walk around for that little bit of extra. Yeah. Hmm. I think it'd be really cool because you could see um, all the other challenges and how many steps they do. So, you know, if you're struggling to get, let's say, 5,000 steps a day. Maybe you live a sedentary life. Uh, maybe, you know, you're working from home or, or whatever reason. That's that's cool. That's fine. And your goal is to maybe get to from 5,000 steps to 6,000 steps. Maybe that's your goal and that's a totally acceptable goal. Um, and you look at the leaderboard and you're maybe, you know, 1,000th out of um, all the challenges that have uh, connected their, uh, you know, Fitbit or smart device to the, the app or such. And you see all these other challenges that are, you know, getting... 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 and beyond steps. And that might give you a little bit of motivation to go, oh, well, you know, if a thousand other people can do it, like, oh, I can do it too. And then, you know, that might give you a little bit of push for motivation to go for a walk around the block or maybe, you know, get the, the steps up around like the kitchen island um, at home or walking around the couch instead of sitting there watching TV. So I'm really excited for this feature. And I'm really excited to uh, have a little bit of friendly competition with other challenges. And who knows, Nick, maybe we'll introduce a new prize to the the final prizes uh we'll call it like the the step champion whoever got the most steps in the yeah challenge. that'd be awesome and i look i don't think we'll be on there so don't stress about us or anything unless you want to stalk what we're doing i don't really know <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't worked that out but i'm happy to put my money where my mouth is but i won't be doing more than ten thousand unless required i'm telling you now <laughs> yeah and like we've spoken about steps in the past yeah. you know there is that tipping point where uh, absolutely more steps might not be beneficial so you know if you're doing uh, let's say something ridiculous like 30,000 steps a day, maybe because you, I don't know, you work at a, an Amazon warehouse and you have to walk like, you know, a kilometer to each side of the, the warehouse and you end up doing 30,000 steps a day. Okay, that might be really great, but then that can also be um, limiting in your ability to, uh, you know, lift weights or to exercise later on. Like, you know, I just did a pretty hard leg session as I do on a Monday, because Monday legs day, right? <laughs> Step aside chest day, it's all about legs day. If I did, let's say 30,000 steps yesterday, you bet my legs are gonna be sore today and you bet I won't be able to squat heavy today. So uh, it's a bit of a limiting factor. So there is that tipping point and that's around maybe 15,000 steps or so where it becomes a little bit limiting to your ability to train. 100%, and I can attest to that. I've put myself through it. And um, since I've stopped stepping as much, my training performance and muscle development has really improved yeah yeah um so yeah i'd say like a good range um like we mentioned i think it was just very last week was about maybe that five to fifteen thousand steps is probably a good range to to aim for but it's going to be all in show um if you'd like it to of course in our um in our new app which is launching very soon i'm really excited yeah that's just such an exciting feature that's just one of the features but how good is it how, how good, good is it Mm -hmm. Now, Nick, I actually have here written down in our little podcast schedule that I want to talk about the meal plan on our app. Okay. Uh, so if you've done the challenge previously, you know that we have transitioned from a PDF to a, a spreadsheet and we call it a template where it's a meal plan that will assign you or prescribe you or suggest um, how much energy to consume and how much of each food to consume. And it's a template where you can actually adjust it. And we have recreated that feature in our meal plan on the um, new M Challenge app. Okay, so when our prep week begins, you'll be able to move into the nutrition section of the app and you could set up your meal plan. So it's gonna ask you for your current age, your current weight, your, um, and um, your physical activity level, uh, height as well. So age, height, weight, and then physical activity level. Um, and then it's going to prescribe how many calories to consume. Um, and then in that meal plan, it's going to uh, allocate you those calories that you're prescribed 
and then a protein target that you're prescribed. Um, and then the uh, carb to fat ratio will ultimately come down to preference. So, um, you know, we know that the uh, ratio between carbs and fats aren't super important for, you know, body composition changes. So priority one is calories, priority two is protein, and then, you know, we've got carbs and fats. And that will be the outline of our meal plan. And then we have, um, you know, this really cool feature like we've done previously in our templates and in our workbooks where you can actually start to modify and adjust the meal plan. So if you don't like chicken, you can swap that out for beef. If you don't like carrots, you can swap it out for broccoli. Um, if you're not a fan of um, uh, maybe white pasta, you can swap it out for whole meal pasta and such. So there's that really cool swap feature. And as you swap individual foods, it will allocate you the equivalent of that new food. So um, very similar, uh, but different to something like, let's say, you know, MyFitnessPal, you add a food and you can type in how much you want. Uh, this is like that next step further where it assigns you a food, you can swap it out and it's gonna actually tell you how much of each food to eat so you can stick within your calorie prescription. So I'm really excited for you to use the meal plan um, version of our, uh, our app. Um, and then of course, if you're not a fan of our meal plans, there are hundreds of recipes to choose from as well, where we've got all the um, macros and calories um, and how to prepare each of those recipes. Um, that's when we built into our recipe section on the app as well. So the whole nutrition portion of the app is going to be really exciting to use. And it's all going to be in one place right next to the training, right next to the forum, right next to our, our journals and dashboard and goal setting um, and our shop and everything in between. So it's going to be really cool features on the app once it's launched. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'm excited about it. I can't wait. Recipes getting added all the time. By yeah. Chef Chef Nick. <laughs> Chef Nick, yes. We're going to, have to add that to your your long list of titles. I know, except challenge. anyone who's listened to the podcast quite a bit will will probably quote me on saying I'm not much of a cook. So <laughs> what's Chef Nick going to come up with? But um, <laughs> my my kind of motto is, um, you know, quick, easy, tasty, healthy type stuff. So, um, yeah, a bit of that. And then there's all your fancy stuff as well. Don't you worry about that. There's fancy stuff that wasn't created by me, believe me. <laughs> fancy so, with a PH. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <Fat. laughs> yeah. Look, Nick, let's move on to our NSVs mm -hmm. for the week. And remember, our NSVs are our non-scale victories where we want to celebrate those victories that might not be linked to the changes on the scales. And I want to take a moment to celebrate our Facebook social hub. So if you're not there already, go check out our Facebook social hub where we have um, a very large community getting close to 10,000 members um, who are highly active in this kind of, I'm gonna say awkward period between um, challenges and the transition to this M challenge. And, you know, it's amazing to see so many individuals that are still participating in their own fitness journey. So we know that, you know, fitness is all about the, those moving goalposts, about something new, something exciting, something shiny around the corner in, in fitness. And it's amazing to see that so many individuals on our Facebook social hub are continuing their fitness journey. They haven't just hung up the towel, or thrown in the towel, whatever the, the analogy is. They're continuing, they're going, they're training, they're meal prepping and all that good stuff. So I think that's probably the, the biggest uh, NSV this week is celebrating those individuals on our Facebook social hub. Always, always. I love that. I love seeing what everyone's doing. Keep it up. Um, once again, I can't say it enough. Whenever I'm speaking to anybody who's been successful in the challenge, they always talk about how they've integrated with themselves with the community, whether it's watching or participating, but they're, they're involving themselves in some way and that's taking them to the next level. It's amazing. Now, Nick, uh, tell us, I, I, I believe you have an NSV this week. Do you want to tell us about it? Who, me? Yes, oh, me. Oh, could be. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's enough about me. Let me tell you all about my um, school washing at the moment. So um, uh, for anyone who's interested, I am prepping for a couple of shows at the end of the year. So I'm in a bit of a calorie deficit at the moment. We're not going crazy, but um, I really, it's all about keeping the strength this time. And what I love is that I still get to do some really good training, which I mean, I say good, every all training is good, but for me, it's like that low rep, heavy stuff. I, I just can't get enough of that. That's what actually inspires me and motivates me to get into the gym. So if that goes away, um, it's not as easy for me to want to go in, but anyway, that's another conversation. So I... The, the best squats I've ever done in my life are about 135 to 137 kilos. I've always managed to do that, but 140 was like this big barrier, the same as when I did deadlift. Um, well, I still do do deadlifts, but 140 was this big thing for me. So um, 
anyway, with the 140 squat, I put it on my back and I gave it a go. And I thought, I'm actually going to fold in half. Like I, I've never felt this before in my life. And then it all c- came back to me about how, um, you know, we always talk about squats, and the core and everything. It's like, whoa, well, where's my core? I'm like a piece of spaghetti that's cooked. Like, Ugh. so um, I had to really concentrate. It was like I had to bring everything. Anyway, so um, I got really scared, but I, I overcame it. And I think in the next couple of weeks, I'll actually be able to do a proper rep of it. But um, I was really, we concentrated on, um just going down um and yeah just doing that a couple of times um and yeah it was just it was just a mental barrier for me so if I've got it because I know that I've done if I could do 135 I could do 140 but it's just that mental barrier so I was able to overcome that because I didn't even want to to go down there so it was like ah it was scary but I did it and um, it's not long now until I push it all the way back up. So stay tuned for that. But I just want to tell you, like, as a coach, it's not like um, there's always stuff that I'm learning and trying to do and trying to be better with. And, yeah, my goal is to really maintain that strength as much as I can as I get leaner and leaner and leaner um, and fade away to nothing. But I still want to be a ball of muscle. So you you heard it first here. A ball of muscle. I love that. And yeah, I can I can relate to that. The one forty, the the three three plates on each side. That's a that's a big yes. mental barrier. Yeah. Oh, it was so exciting because it's like those big plates. And I think that was another thing where I was like, oh, hang on. Um, oh, even I just had a moment of of imposter syndrome where I'm like, I, I'm not a three plate squat person. Get out of town because it was not long ago that I was just working with a hundred, but something's clicked with me. I think it's, as we said, with the less walking and finally, I think all of our podcasts, I've actually listened to our own information and really, become, I don't know what's happened to me. This is my time to shine. Look out everybody, <laughs> NSV and I'm NC. I'm Nicoletta Cepolini. So NC's NSV. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. I know, no, right? I love that. I love that. Well, I think what 140 is going to come uh, sooner than you think. And we're all excited to see that. I know. Stop it. I'm going to tag M challenge official as soon as it happens. Like before I even stand up, I'm going to be down at the bottom going, I can do this. M challenge. <laughs> so look out everybody. No, I love that. Uh, yeah. I've got an NSV, Nick. I've got an NSV. So, um, Coach Steve as uh, dad mode. Um, we're, we've been at home quite a bit with, with baby, baby George. He's eight months old, okay? And his latest trick is being able to pull himself up and stand up, okay? Which is pretty pretty cool. I'm pretty excited about that. So he's going up to the couch, pulling himself up. He's going up to the windowsill, pull, pulling himself up. On the, the, the dining table, uh, the little like coffee table Cute. pulls himself up. Uh, but then yeah, anybody who's a parent knows where the story goes, where uh, he'll ultimately, you know, get really excited, whack, whack, whack his hand and then um, fall over and, you know, hit his head on the ground or something like that. Then it's the very slow silence and then, and then, yeah, okay, that's always fun. So the other day, uh, baby George uh, falls over, hits his head, he's he's crying, uh, unconsolable. Okay, great. He's okay. He's okay. Um, At the same time, the dog gets really excited. Um, because baby's crying, dog's now barking. It was chaos of the house. So I thought, all right, that's it. Everybody out of the house. So um, I told my partner, you're staying home. You chill out, you relax. You've had a big day. I'm going to take baby. I'm going to take dog and we're going to go for a walk. Okay. Now, uh, often it's um, both my partner and I taking baby and the dog for a walk because uh, my dog, a little cavoodle, uh, she's a bit of a nutcase sometimes. Um, and then with the baby, sometimes it's hard holding dog and baby at the same time in the pram, that type of thing. So I thought, no, I, that's it. I'm taking everybody. So uh, my NSV is being able to coordinate both the baby and the dog um, around my neighborhood, up and down the hills um, for a stroll while baby calmed down, dog chilled out, everyone got home and uh, my partner was asleep. So it was a great day. Um, that was my NSV. Just a nice little win, little family win. Well done. And thank you for that. Thanks for doing that. We all appreciate it. Um, it's whenever your partner helps you out. It is amazing. That's the biggest NSV. It's much better than 140. Yeah. Much better than 140. Co-parenting. I know it's, it's, a, it's a crazy concept to, to think about, but uh, yeah, no, I think that every dad out there should be, uh, you know, parenting as equally as, as all the moms out there. Definitely. I think that's best. And um, I love it when Shane gets their devices off them and I don't have to worry about that when he goes, devices. And I think, (laughs) yes, it's not me tonight. (laughs) I love that. Nick, 
let's move on to our next segment here, the Coach's Corner, where we offer our tip for the week. So Nick, take us away. What advice do you have for us? It's funny because I'm giving you advice on blocking out the noise. So you, you just unblock the noise to listen to this advice and then re-block it. But um, I think, you know, once this is sort of for people that are starting out or possibly re-entering the fitness realm, there's a few different things that you really need to trust your intuition about. Um, so when it comes to your diet, your family and your friends might um, try and pull you back into something that they're familiar with you being such as like perhaps having a few drinks with them or um, going out to dinner with them or you know you might see yourself as the life of the party or whatever it is um, and your intuition is telling you that it's enough now and it's time to do something else but then you're getting pulled in that way so um, I think it's really important to, to learn how to trust that and um set yourself some goals about um, what success is for you. So I would start with the question, who am I versus who do I want to be? So just stop and ask yourself that question. Because if who you would like to be doesn't include necessarily, I'm using alcohol as an example, but you know, going out, that kind of thing, if you want to take some time away from that to get to who you want to be, then that's okay. So you need to define your version of success. Now, this is really interesting because for someone, um, success could be, you know, say for me, success would be perhaps cutting back from three coffees a day to two coffees a day, you know, that or um, getting, you know, nine hours of sleep instead of 8.5 or something. So it's, it's sort of that pointy end and that's going to matter. It's going to matter a lot when I go to that um, really super lean version because that's my version of success. That's what I'm going for. For somebody else, it may be, um, you know, not having a biscuit with your coffee. Everybody's version of success is different. It's a personal thing and you can only judge from your own standards, not somebody else's narrative. So I really wanted to make that clear for anyone who's starting out. Your version of success is your own version. So trust your intuition about where you want to be. If you want to do 30,000 steps and that makes you feel good and moving makes you feel happy, then you go for that as well. That's the other thing. So obviously, in terms of specific goals, it might be better to go in a certain way as in muscle growth and things like that. But what we're actually talking about here is just um, trying to get out of that rut. So just for, for pure beginners or people that are restarting. So there's that. So that's trusting your intuition. So there's a few ways that you can do that. And that's just, I think, writing things down and being really clear. So I've gone through that in previous podcasts. The other thing I want to quickly go through is trusting your intuition in the gym. Now, this one's probably a little bit more complex, but um, this is to do with, and you can chat to me about this as well, because you know, you're, you're good at this, Coach D, but about reps in reserve. And the reason that I want to just quickly touch on that is because I reckon for the last eight to 10 years, I've been bullshitting myself a little bit about my reps in reserve. I've been going, oh, I don't know. I guess I'll just see. And do you know what? When, once you actually connect with reps in reserve so how many reps you think you have left when you completed your set um how many you think you might have i reckon if you actually connect with that properly and listen to your intuition and really work with your body to understand that i think personally that's where the growth happens because i'm trying to i'm trying to grapple with how i've gone so well in the last year or so maybe it's because i met you coach steve do you think no, there's surely not a correlation. I don't, I don't know. There's no correlation. Well, maybe maybe listening to all this information, I'm not sure. You can tell me. But, um, yeah, I just think really, really tapping into that because I think, as I've said to you before, the mindlessness that I've had previously with training with weights has come from that endurance background where you just have to endure. You might not do the rep properly. You, you, it's, all, it's, all, it's almost like just getting through you know, just getting through. Once you get rid of that and you go, where am I really going to fail this rep? How's it really going to happen? Have I got another one left in the tank? With that good form, as, as we say, you know, not with silly form, but with perfect form, like the first rep, maybe, maybe a little bit of a breakdown, but not too much. 
where's that? Because that's where you're going to find that growth. I think truly connecting with that reps in reserve. How do you feel about that? I love that. I love that. Oh, and without, without, without taking away too much from uh, maybe the, the whole context of what you're saying here, Nick, about, you know, trusting yourself and blocking out maybe that, that external noise. Mm. Um, I think talking about like reps in reserve is a really um, internal uh, process mm. and especially trying to delineate the difference between, okay, um, w- why am I choosing to stop at rep number seven, eight, nine, 11, 13, whatever it is, why am I choosing to stop at that rep? Is it because, um, you know, I, I, I've mentally given up. Is it because my, my body's telling me no, my body's telling me no. Um, is <laughs> it, is it, yes. <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, right. <laughs> no, no, it's the other way around. Oh, my heart, so yeah. Anyway, um, you know, is it because like I I'm out of breath is it because my heart's pumping. Is it because, you know, I, I told myself I was going to do 10 reps. I did 10 reps and that that's it. Mm-hmm. It's over. You know, it's really trying to understand like, why am I choosing to do that? And, you know, thinking about reps in reserve, like my current thoughts about it, especially around maybe like muscle building, you know, hypertrophy is a little bit more around, um, you know, am I hitting the target muscle, right? So uh, just a a side story from your coach's corner tip tip here, Nick, you know, my experiences with um, RDLs, Romanian deadlifts or or stiff Mm -hmm. legged deadlift, you know, same, same, but different type, type movement, a hip hinge, um, you know, for the longest time, I really had a hard time connecting with my hamstrings. I felt it a lot in my glutes and in my low back, and I've been testing out different ways to kind of really make my hamstrings explode. And for me, you know, I could sit there and or, or stand there with, you know, 100 kilos on a barbell and, you know, bust out reps. Like that's kind of like a warm up weight for me on a deadlift. So mm. I can start to change an RDL or change a stiff leg a deadlift just to become a regular deadlift. And I can, you know, do deadlifts all day um, with 100 kilos. Okay. But mm. for me to uh, do a repetition that biases my hamstrings, you know, I get to rep number eight and I could still keep going, but then I no longer feel it in my hamstrings. You know, I start to feel my glutes take over. I start to feel like my back take over and I start to feel like my whole body, maybe even on my quads as I kind of like bend my knees a bit more. So for me, my reps in reserve is when I no longer like feel the target muscle. And that's when I cancel the, the set. I'm like, that's it. I'm done with the set. You know, I could have done another 10 reps, but that would have been, wouldn't have been hamstring RDLs, they would have been, you know, basically like deadlifts. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing can happen um, with other individuals across, uh, you know, a range of different exercises. The classic one we've spoken about previously in other podcasts is a bicep curl, where people no longer do a bicep curl, they do maybe like a frontal raise because they're swinging the arm up um, or they're, you know, leaning their chest forward or backwards to try to do more reps. It's no longer a bicep curl anymore, it's something else. So uh, I think that's where my idea of reps and reserve have, have kind of moved towards. Um, and that might be a, a little bit different to other people's definitions and that's okay. That's fine. That's normal. Uh, but I think it's very internal. And once you kind of make that, that, uh, uh, observation as what's making you stop at that repetition, um, that could be the breakthrough of a, of a, a, a plateau or an imaginary barrier that you have. Yeah, for sure. And even just being able to, cause you don't always have to go like to that, to that end point. So even being able to recognize, I reckon I could do another four good ones, you know, that kind of a thing, sort of having that auto regulation, I think knowing what's going on for you is so valuable. And I, I wonder if that's almost what takes you to sort of beginner from beginner to intermediate, you know, that kind of real knowledge of your body, and knowing, oh, I had four reps left. I don't need to have them today. I've done what I need to do, but they're there. Like, mm-hmm. I, I love that. Um, yeah. And I yeah. just, I think it's taken me quite some time because I think I've just just smashed a lot of stuff out for, for years without thinking properly about it. I think it's possibly the bodybuilding now that makes it makes you think um, a little bit more. You know, even though I'm talking more about sort of strength training here as well, um, like in terms of just that really hard push of the, the few reps that you could have as well. But I don't know, it's all intertwined. So it's fascinating to me. So I just wanted to, yeah, that, I mean, they're not really related, those two things, but I just wanted to tell everybody my thoughts this week about everything. <laughs> and it's my corner, so I can say whatever I want in it. <laughs> No, I love that. I love that. No, thanks. no, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Nick. Uh, yes. Over the past five weeks, I have created a mini series in our Challenge Weekly Show series. So a series within a series, seriesception, I've been calling it. 
So we had our five part mini series of hypertrophy tips where I walked you through a few concepts and theories and ideas around hypertrophy. And Nick, it's time for a new mini series. Okay, good. Because I'm I'm actually, can I just say I'm in between, I just finished Ozark on Netflix and I'm really sad and I've seen Saul and I've seen Breaking Bad. So I need a new series. So need a new series. Yeah. This is it, isn't it? You know what? We we finished Ozark the other week. Well, yeah. just this week as well. And I, I don't know how I felt about the ending, ending, the oh. final scene. I was a bit, mm, okay. They need anyway. to add more, but they've already done a documentary on how it's all over. But if anyone has any suggestions on what to watch after Ozark, um, please <laughs> let us know. I think we're going to hit up Breaking Bad. I've just got a box set. Oh, have you great. not seen yeah. it? I, about 10 years ago, uh, back in high school, I watched Breaking Bad. But uh, have you I'm seen not, Saul? Have no. you seen, you've got to see Saul. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, Nick, Nick, let's go back to my coach's corner here. Right. My little mini series, a mini series. I'm going to talk about nutrition for fat loss. Mm-hmm. Nutrition for fat loss. We're going to break it down to the basics. And at part one of this mini series, we're going to bring it back to the very basics calories. Let's talk about understanding calories. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, what is a calorie? A calorie is a unit of measurement. Okay. So, similar to like a uh, a degree, you know, in Melbourne right now, it's pretty cold. It's, you know, what, 10 degrees or something. It's similar to how we measure like length in centimeters. Um, it's similar to how we measure weight in, in kilograms. Um, a calorie is a unit of measure and uh, a measurement, and it's how we measure energy. So energy that our body utilizes and uses for, for, for life, you know, for movement, for, um, for production, for maintaining our tissues to all the good stuff that our body does the energy that it requires. Okay. Now, um, you know, that means that a calorie isn't something that you can see. It's not like you can grab, uh, I don't know, a, a human body or a piece of food or something like that. And, you know, put it under a microscope and be like, oh, look, there's the calories because you can't actually see it. It's how we, we measure it. Now, how do we measure a calorie? It's put into a device. Um, some early devices were called a calorometer where we would uh, put the food inside um, a, a device and what it measures is how much energy or, or uh, heat it takes for that food to increase temperature by one degree. Okay, so um, technically in food, we're talking about kilocalories, but you know, colloquially we call it a calorie. Um, it used to be kind of more linked to, to water, so how much energy it takes for a unit of water to increase by, by one degree. Um, but around food, it's all about how much uh, energy it takes for that food to, to increase by, by one degree. Okay, so that means that some foods take a lot longer for that food to increase in, in temperature, um, and some foods, uh, it takes a, lot, it's a shorter time. So different foods have different energy amounts. Now, what does this have to do with fat loss? Well, put simply, um, fat loss is a, a very simple equation, difficult to apply and difficult to maintain in our body and, and to make those changes. I acknowledge that, I understand that, but on paper, it's a really simple formula where we're looking at how much energy we consume in our body versus how much energy we expend in our, bo- our body. And I have a brand new analogy this week. Last week was a whole bunch of analogies, but this, this week, a little bit of a story and an analogy. So back in high school, I was really cool. I used to do army cadets, Nick, I used to do mm-hmm. army cadets. Okay. And that was really great. Cause, uh, you know, it was a bunch of, um, teenage boys, um, going out into the, the, the bush in Australia and the forest. And, you know, we used to go, uh, you know, camping outside and we used to go and navigate around and we learned how to use a compass, and read a map and all that stuff. And one of the, the greatest memories that I had as a teenager was um, going into the bush and building a, or digging a, a pit and making a fire. Okay, it's so making a fire. And when you, you may have had this experience, Nick, or our listeners here have had that experience of, you know, creating a bonfire or maybe you're camping and you create a small fire. So when you create this fire, you can keep adding fuel to that fire and the fire will steadily grow bigger. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then if you want that fire to slowly die down, you just give it less fuel and the fire will eventually grow smaller. And that's a very similar concept to our body. Imagine your body is literally like a bonfire. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you want your body to grow bigger, as in gain mass, you want it to either gain body fat, that's a goal for some people, or gain muscle mass, which is more in line with the goals that we have in the challenge. We wanna be providing our body with additional energy so that it can grow bigger. And that's just like making your bonfire bigger 
with adding wood to the fire and or other things, but we wanna be adding fuel, adding energy to the fire so that the fire can become bigger. That's essentially what we're doing in our body. Now, mm -hmm. if you wanted to go in the opposite direction, you wanted to make your bonfire smaller, all right? You don't want to make a smaller fire. Um, most of us probably simply go, oh, well, you can just wait, right? And don't add any, fu any, any fuel to the fire, right? Don't add any extra energy. And yeah, that's, that's essentially what happens in the body. If you want to become smaller, you just don't provide it any more energy and it will slowly become smaller. But that's not closely linked to what we want as humans because a human is, an, is a bonfire, right? So we still need energy to maintain life. Like I need energy for my brain to work. Sometimes I need energy for my heart to work. I need mm -hmm. energy for my digestive system to do its thing. I need energy for my quads to do squats and stuff like that, right? So I can't just simply not give my bonfire any more fuel. I need to give it small amounts of fuel um, so it can keep kind of going, but then it slowly gets smaller in size, okay? And that's a very simple analogy for the process of changing our body fat levels or changing our body composition with our nutrition is to simply look at the energy that we're consuming, regardless of what it is, right? Of course, we all know that, you know, if you ate more, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables and lean sources of protein, and maybe drink some more water and had some more vitamins and minerals, you would probably feel better. You know, your bonfire would be a, a nice bonfire rather than a big smoky one that's in your face and out of control and all that other stuff. So yeah, okay, there's different types of bonfires, but the simple idea is ultimately comes down to the amount of energy that we consume versus the energy that we expend. And another little fun analogy that gets thrown into that analogy is that, you know, the bigger your fire, the more, um, you know, energy it, it expends, right? So that is a, a similar strategy to what we do in the challenge where we're trying to focus on building a bigger fire for you, as in building more muscle mass, so you expend more energy, so that you can consume more fuel, right? More, more, more firewood, um, and you could still do life without getting uh, any, any more bigger than it is. Uh, so that's a fun little analogy to think about. Think of your body as a bit of a bonfire and understanding the amount of, um, amount of energy that you're consuming versus you know, the energy that you're expending. If you're expending more energy than you consume, you're gonna start becoming smaller, hopefully in, in, in fat loss. Um, and if you are consuming more energy than you consume, you're gonna start getting bigger, hopefully in muscle mass. But that sums up nutrition for fat loss, number one. Listen for the next tip next week because um, you'll learn a lot and your fire will get bigger or smaller depending on <laughs> what you want. Well, yeah, just as a, as a, uh, a little, little trailer for next week. So make sure you check out next week. We're going to be talking about our macronutrients and their effect on the fire. Ooh, That's great. I love What's... that because people, people, you know, at first you think, oh, calories, but then once you start getting into macros as well, you realize um, some important things, which coach Steve will elaborate on next week. So tune in. Tune in and you might find out the difference between if you put on, uh, you know, dried out firewood versus, you know, when you put on like a really green bit of firewood, how it gets really like smoky or like that white smoke comes out and doesn't burn well and stuff. Yeah. So we might, might, might add to our little analogy. It's going to be great, Nick. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Um, I was going to say something, but then I thought, no, because there's probably heaps of vegetarians that listen. So I was going to say like um, something about meat, but I'm not going to just in case. <laughs> No, it's good. Nick, let's move on to our question and answer segment. Mm -hmm. So first question here, how do I get my motivation back? Ooh, Nick, tell us, how do I get my, my motivation back? Okay, so um, you had it and it went away. Um, that is really, you've answered your own question because it is something that, I mean, I don't know how many times I've ever woken up and gone, I'm really motivated to do everything today. It just isn't something that you can rely on. So the word motivation, yeah, somebody said it the other day in, in the, the um, Facebook group. And it's, I think the thing is, once, once I boiled down and answered the question, that person was actually doing everything already. So um, they, they had the dedication, they had the discipline and um, they had the routine in place already because I said, oh, perhaps you could start by walking. And they're like, no, I'm already doing that. I'm already running. I'm already um, eating well. I'm training three times a week. So it's like, I think they were thinking that there was always going to be a feeling that comes with that of going, oh, I can't wait 
And often that just isn't there. So it's that feeling. And the only thing I could suggest for that sort of that feeling of wanting to run and jump into it. And what I did suggest was have a go at doing something that you like for a few days. So do your favorite of all the training programs. It doesn't matter if it's out of order or anything like that. Your body, you'll be okay for a few days, especially in between challenges. Pick one of your favorite exercises and work on the technique for that. You know, go on a nice walk, go on a hike, do something a little bit different, do a yoga class, um, have a go at Pilates, something completely new. And um, then you'll probably find that that you get a little bit of a spark there. And also often, just say you've completely lost any mojo to go anywhere or do anything, um, often just getting out into that Um, into the air having a walk or even doing one training session you're only one training session away from a good mood really that's what I think and you're only one meal away from changing your entire way of looking at food and things so if you had a, a crappy meal if you had a crappy lot of time with food just make the next meal or the next training session the one where you get on with it and it changes your mood and mindset pretty quickly yeah, I like that. And I think I could relate to it. Um, you know, me personally, um, ever since my powerlifting event, um, my motivation hasn't been really high. Does that mean I, I stopped training? No, like I still, you know, rock up and I still do some hard sets and I still enjoy, you know, some elements of it. But, you know, my my hunger, my fire, as you would, um, you know, isn't isn't quite, quite the same. And that's okay. You know, motivation, um, you know, isn't, um, you know, consistent. Right. And I think you've nailed it there, Nick, where um, if it's not there, you know, you, it's about maybe modifying a few things and bringing back the things that you enjoy. So like for me, um, I have modified my, my training around like hypertrophy. I just I love hypertrophy. I love the pump. Right. Um, and, you know, that gives me that internal um, reward system. You know, I go and train, I get that reward. I feel great, cool, awesome, happy days. Like, you know, I might not have been super excited uh, to go and train, but I still kind of got some enjoyment out of it. And uh, it's about figuring out what makes you excited again. Um, and then a lot of the times that motivation is kind of um, maybe goal driven. So I was really excited to train because I had a goal. I've got my powerlifting event coming up. Nick, you might be really excited because oh, I've got my shows coming up this, uh, towards the end of the year. You're in the challenge. Oh, it's, you know, 10, we're in week, uh, week 10, two more weeks. I'm really excited. Or oh, it's going to be 12 weeks, 84 days. I'm going to nail it. I'm really excited. You know, those, those are uh, a big driving elements to our motivation. And if they aren't there, um, you know, motivation can wane, but it, it does come back and that's okay. Yeah. And also I think like just to expand on that, I think it's important to remember that you're always training for, for say the challenge or you for your powerlifting, everything that you do is going to contribute to that either way. So if you don't do anything, you're going to contribute to getting worse and worse and further and further away from eventually doing another comp or you can do your hypertrophy. You can get, you know, you can get, um, swole and do other things but you're still working towards ultimately having the the best physique for you that you can that will be able to adapt to all sorts of things so um say for for me if I'm not doing a show I I regress to well you know my my comfort zone is to do strength training it's like well that's going to help me at some point you know, it's not going to hinder me at all. So I can just, you know, I go back to that. It's my comfort zone. It's like, you know, shove out a few deadlifts and make myself feel awesome. And that that's sort of my little comfort zone. So find your little comfort zone and then do that and then um, move forward. I love that. Hmm. Nick, next question here. Is there any way to tell if I'm going to get injured? Mm. Is there any way to tell that if I'm going to get injured? Okay, let's talk about it. So firstly, uh, no, there's not a, a, a very consistent or clear way to tell um, if you're going to get injured. Okay, so when we talk about injuries, it's like the risk of injury occurring. Um, you know, it's, it's very weak uh, evidence about, you know, what might be the, um, you know, maybe the cause of that injury. So for example, um, you know, you can't tell clearly through technique, so how someone completes an exercise, if they're going to injure themselves. <laughs> um, so regardless on what you believe uh, an exercise should look like and what um, could increase the risk of injury occurring, such as you know a rounded back on a deadlift um, or uh, you know 
uh, bending your wrist back when you're doing a, a bench press, whatever it is, um, there's no way to uh, clearly uh, have a correlation between those two activities that's going to cause an injury occurring. Okay, of course, there's like those really obvious things like, hey, you've got your face under a barbell that is falling, you've got to hurt yourself, right? So then of course, there's some really obvious things that is just going to be maybe more a, a oh and type issue, right? <laughs> Rather than, um, you know, an yeah. actual injury occurring from that thing. Now we know that, um, you know, bodybuilding style training, right, you know, sets and reps, um, or even uh, strength style training, resistance training as a whole has a very low injury rate. Something like, uh, I think it was less than three injuries per 1000 hours of uh, strength training, okay, when we compare that to something like, you know, footy, right, or other contact sports, it's upwards of 50 um, injuries per 1000 hours, so really high amounts of injuries per 1000 hours, um, in those other sports, right, which most of us are like, oh yeah, go play footy, go kids, go play footy. And we don't think twice about the risk of injury. Whereas for some reason, when we're doing squats and deadlifts and bicep curls, we think that that's a really dangerous activity, which is not, right? Um, so the only thing that is going to increase the risk of injury occurring is when you train above your capacity. So let's say Coach Nick is doing her squats and she wants to go and squat 140 kilos. It's a little bit above her capacity right now. You know, she's in PB territory. So that has a higher risk of injury occurring than if she squatted 60 kilos. So, you know, one plate on each side, a very low, low, low risk of injury occurring. As she starts upping it, you know, three plates on each side, higher risk of injury occurring. Does that mean that Nick should never do 140 kilos? No, like we need to be comfortable with that level of risk, but we need to understand that, okay, a risk can occur when we're trying to train above our capacity, okay? And, and sustained periods in um, uh, above our capacity with other variables, such as if you're super fatigued, you've had poor quality sleep, poor quality hydration, um, and you know poor quality nutrition, those types of factors can increase the risk of injury occurring. Now, the other thing that might increase the risk of injury occurring are some of those little aches and pains and those little niggles that we have when we're training, okay? So we call these things non-time loss injuries, okay? So it's when you sustain an injury, right? Maybe a little bit of pain, oh, my shoulder's a little bit icky, right? Um, and that doesn't cause us to lose any time when we're training, because we can still train, uh, we could train around that shoulder, great happy days. If we completely ignore that shoulder, there is some data that suggests that that can increase the risk of another injury occurring. Think of it like an early warning sign. Okay, my shoulder's being a little bit icky. Like, why is it icky? Is it icky? I keep using the word icky. icky. Uh, is, is it icky? Dog. Right? Is it icky because really my shoulder can handle, let's say, 10 sets of a bench press per week and I'm doing 11. So, you know, it's just a little bit over. It's going, hey, Steve, you know, don't be an idiot right now. It's just, uh, it's not going to stop me from bench pressing, but it's a little bit icky, right? That can increase the risk of injury occurring um, from memory is about uh, up to a third. So about 30% increased risk of injury from these non-time loss injuries. So is there a way to tell if I'm going to get injured? injured? Well, there is one way and that would be to, um, you know, simply listen to your body. If you are experiencing those kind of niggles and aches and pains, um, that might be a sign that your program, um, you know, might not be designed well uh, or implemented well, meaning that maybe you are uh, training at a too high of an intensity, you're trying to take too many sets to failure, or you're doing just too many sets in general, um, or, you know, maybe you're not managing your, um, your, your fatigue correctly. So maybe your sleep quality is like low or your nutrition is low where you can't um, maintain that level in training. And that's, that's totally fine. Like, you know, I had to uh, drastically changed my training um, as soon as I became a dad. You know, my sleep was was different. My um, day to day life was different because now I have to chase around after a kid all day. Um, so you know, could I train the same that I, I used to when I was maybe in my early twenties? No, because I'm tired now. Um, you know, I'm aging and uh, I've got a kid now. So you know, things are different, right? And that's ancient. okay because I'm ancient. That's it. I'm getting old. I've got gray hairs. But no, no, no that, that 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 doesn't mean I, I completely throw it all away. It just means that I need to regulate things a little bit differently while I can still achieve my goal to the best that I possibly can. Okay. Nick, next question here. What's the difference between Maxine's sip and burn, Maxine's sip and burn, and Maxine's melt? Ooh, Nick, 
What's the difference? All right. So, yeah, they're both two of our products, obviously. Um, now, Sip and Burn is um, branch chain amino acids. So um, they're actually really good for um, recovery and um, also intra-workout. So during your workout, it's good. Um, so they can um, help um, recovery, repair the growth, growth of muscle tissue. Um, yeah, they're, they're actually, they're also good to just um, sip on. You know, it's good to be, as we said, hydrated in your workout. So it's sort of that double whammy of being able to have something that's good for your body, replenishing, recovering, and then also hydration. Um, it's also got L-glutamine. So, um, yeah, that's a good one. So that's re muscle recovery. Um, also, it's good for gut health as well. So um, we like sip and burn. And then um, melt is a thermogenic. So we talked about um, fat burners, thermogenics. Um, I think it was last week, was it? I can't remember anymore. I believe it was two weeks ago. Oh, okay. okay. So it's got um, a few different fat burning um, ingredients in it. And it's also got nootropics. So um, ashwagandha, which I love. Um, that's that's a really good one because that helps your central nervous system and stuff. Um, but it's got um, your caffeine. It's got, now that we have a read, just to make sure, it's got L-carnitine. Um, it's got green tea extract. It's got guarana. Well, that's the mouth-watering melon. So um, the, the melon has the caffeine and there's one that doesn't have caffeine. So um, fat burner versus branched chain amino acids. So I would be having, personally, I would have the melt prior to working out if it's the sim one with the caffeine and things otherwise you could have it pretty much all day but i still would have it in my order i would have it prior to working out and then um during the workout and after like pretty much all day i'd have my sip and burn that's how i'd do it but then if you are training in the afternoon i'd probably go yeah the non-stim melt prior and um, a bit of the sip and burn during but also like i will tend to have if i want a little bit of a sweet treat i will have um sip and burn uh, maybe on a weekend even if i'm not training i'll just have a, a, um, a bit of that because i think um i think the ingredients of brass chain amino acids are always good i think it's good to um have them for for me uh, that's um something that that i i do when people ask me what i take and in what order and i personally like to have the one that's um non-stim even the, the the kiwi lime one even um within the you know prior to working out because i have caffeine extra like many shots so i don't really need extra within my um workout formula as well so just pay attention to that because you don't need to overstimulate yourself with caffeine so if you're having like a black coffee and stuff and you enjoy that perhaps go for the sim free one no good example good uh, explanation of the difference yeah 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 we love them both but yeah. um they're both yeah they're, they're very different to each other even though people you look at them and you think oh i could just have one but they've just got very different um very different functions yeah mm. Nick, final question here. Ooh, a little bit of a doozy question. I know. What, I love this one. What is gluconeogenesis? Ooh. Put your special, you, you can be you can be a beaker, your beaker, you know, from the Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> and you could be the, the one that goes, me or, or me. Mm. me oh, no, that's, that's beaker. So you're the that's other beaker. guy. Okay. Who's he? Who, what's his name? The 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 doctor dude. The doctor dude with the yeah, yeah. with the, with the glasses. Me, 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 me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. It. Let's okay. talk about a little bit of physiology. Uh, mm -hmm. So gluconeogenesis. If you did just Google it, um, it, might come up with a lot of uh, big, long, fancy words. So let's talk about like a an Eli five. Like explain it like I was I was five. Okay. So break down the the name gluconeogenesis. Three parts. Um, take out your little Latin cap. So gluco refers to uh, glucose, gluco. Neo means new and Genesis is the creation. Um, you know, any, any Bible studies out there, Genesis, right? So in, in summary, that word is suggesting that we are creating new glucose, right? We are, we are creating new glucose. And gluconeogenesis is a normal bodily function. Okay, normal bodily function. It's created. It's it's done primarily in the liver, but it's also done in places like the kidneys and the small intestines. And what happens in your body is it detects um, your blood sugar levels. Okay, so glucose in the bloodstream. Uh, so so uh, glucose referring to sugar, right? So blood sugar level. Uh, 
we call that a glucose molecule that, that's floating around the bloodstream. When your blood sugar level is low, the body doesn't like that. It doesn't lo like low uh, sugar in the blood because the brain primarily uses sugar as its source of energy, right? So our body doesn't want our sugar level to be low or our brain function goes down. So what it does is it will uh, create glucose from something else. And this isn't a really fast process. It's quite a, like a, a slow process. Um, and it starts to break down or metabolize um, stored body fats um, or muscle tissue, okay, to break that down and turn that into glucose. So that's where glucose is created, it breaks down fat or muscle. Very slow process, okay. Now, um, does gluconeogenesis directly mean that we're burning fat? Uh, it, yes, in the simplest terms, yeah, we're breaking down fat and we're using it in our bloodstream. But um, going back to our nutrition for fat loss part one, understanding calories, you know, the actual ch big change in our body fat comes down to the energies that we can, energy amount that we consume. So if you consume more energy than you require, you're going to start storing more body fat, maybe faster than the rate that you can break it down. Okay. Now, um, what is a preferred method for our body to utilize sugar is through the digestive system when we consume foods. So if we are consuming adequate sources of carbohydrate, because when we break down carbohydrate, we break it down to its simplest form, which is a glucose molecule or sugar that goes straight into our bloodstream. Okay, so we only ever go through a process of gluconeogenesis when we are in a um, like a fasted state or a starvation state when we don't have a source of um, blood sugar or if we are choosing to go in a low carb um, a, a diet strategy. Okay, so we can uh, drop our blood sugar level, which might be good for some individuals who might be maybe um, you know, insulin resistant or pre-diabetic and such where our blood sugar is actually too high when you bring it back down into a, a new baseline. Um, but that process of gluconeogenesis, again, is a really slow process. So you may find that you are a bit lethargic and tired because your blood sugar level is low. Your body can still survive through gluconeogenesis. Um, but, you know, you may not have the same amount of energy as you did if you just, uh, you know, ate some fruit, right? So that's where it comes into a bit of sports science where we go, well, sure, carbohydrates aren't essential, right? You can survive without carbohydrates, but you can't really thrive, okay? So you can survive without carbohydrates, but you can't really thrive. Um, so what that means is that you, you, if you were put on a desert island, you know, as long as you're getting some adequate um, sources of protein and adequate sources of fats, you could survive. Um, but, you know, you won't be able to squat 200 kilos, right? Um, you wouldn't be able to, you know, run a marathon. Um, you wouldn't be able to do these, these uh, amazing feats that humans can um, when we have adequate sources of carbohydrate where it can go straight into our bloodstream and be utilized as fuel because it has to go through this slow process of, you know, breaking down um, fats and, and proteins and converting it into um, into glucose, yeah. Uh, but that's, that's the, the process of gluconeogenesis. A really uh, interesting um, thing that happens in our body happens naturally. Um, opposite The opposite thing is glycolysis, which is the breakdown of um, carbohydrate, right? So breakdown of carbohydrate into glucose is glycolysis or the creation of glucose. Um, and that, that, that's, that's, that's all in the glu gluconeogenesis, a little bit of a physio physiology lesson for you. How about, um, so what's it with, with ketosis is, is that that's the next step from, um, gluconeogenesis, but like, how do you, some, how, do, how does your body, does your body fight ketosis by doing the gluconeogenesis thing? Or like, how does that work? Yeah. So over a pro prolonged period of time of, um, low, uh, like blood sugar levels, our body starts to utilize ketones, ketones, um, which is the whole process of, of, uh, ketosis. Um, so we do need to have a sustained period of, um, low blood glucose levels so until that effect uh, comes into play. Um, you know, it's, it, it it's up for debate whether we are better on, uh, you know, ketones or better on glucose. Um, most research is suggesting that there's no big difference. And if anything, it, it might be limiting for us to rely on ketones, um, you know, for, for life. Uh, but you know, that, that process is a little bit of a, like a survival mechanism. Cause again, if you're on a desert Island and you know, humans need to survive and we, we evolved into a certain way where we're going to survive in any situation we put into ourselves into. And on this Island, you only had access to, 
you know, some protein and some fats, your body's going to find a way to, to keep on going. So that process of ketosis depends on the individual. Um, it could take, you know, six to eight weeks for that significant change to occur. You probably feel like uh, a, a bit like trash um, for, for, for a month or two before you transition into that kind of ketosis. Um, but, you know, it can work for, for some individuals. Is it optimal? I'm leaning more towards no, um, but there's a huge crowd that say yes. So that decision is up to you. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. You heard it first here. Nick, let's wrap it up here for episode number 67, yeah. where six is afraid of seven, seven, eight, nine. Episode number 67. If you enjoyed this episode, check out the 66 other episodes and we'll catch you next week for episode number 68. Thank you, everybody. I'm waving. <laughs> I don't know why. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you like the show, share it with a friend. Or leave us a review on iTunes to spread the good word. See you next time.